Welcome, it's great to have you here and we look forward to you joining us throughout the Wellbeing Conversation, which is also a collection of stories, a lot of stories. Our aim to share stories from experts, from well-known individuals, from ANZ people, to present unique, inspiring and practical insights to help you navigate through this challenging period. It is great to be here and it's wonderful again to welcome our recurring panellist, ANZ Ambassador, Dylan Alcott. Dylan. G'day Brad, great to be here mate. I've got to say, I absolutely loved episode one. I thought it was going to be tough to top, but we have three cracking people coming up on today's episode. So make sure you stick around. You, you and I were easily the worst to perform in the first episode. And I think you and I will be the worst to perform again. Okay, thanks for instilling that confidence in us. <laughs> but we'll get there. Now, we've got a lot to talk about today because we're talking about flexible working and the new normal. We've got three special guests today. First of all, we welcome ANZ Group Executive Technology, Jared Florian. Jared, great to have you with us. Hey, Brad. Thank you very much. Great to be here and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Uh, as are we. Also joining us today, feedback expert, expert and author, we'll talk about the book, Flawsome, in a moment, Georgia Murch. G'day, Georgia. G'day, Brad. It's nice to see you again, darling. Thanks for having me. You know this is going to be a great chat when you somebody refers to you as darling. So uh, yeah, I'm babe, certainly... darling, babe. love, cheek. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, extending those um, very friendly and easygoing uh, personalities, also joining us is Dominic Dom, Dom oh. Price, Work Futurist at Atlassian. G'day, Dom. How are you doing? Looking forward to this. I, I, I appreciate the fact that Georgia can give a hug using words. When she says the word darling, it's like someone just giving you a little tight squeeze. It's brilliant. Yeah, I agree. This is going to be a lot of fun. And as I mentioned, we've got a lot to get through. So let's get into it. We are going to start off with, I've never done this before, a quote from Dr. Zeus. And Jared, I read this in a piece that you posted on Blue Notes recently. Just enlighten us about that quote. Sure, Brad. So, I mean, the quote pretty simply is that uh, bad things are going to happen. It's a fact of life. And when bad things happen, we've got one of three choices. We can let it destroy us. Um, we can let it define us or we can use it to make us stronger. And certainly as we went into uh, this period, I'd say back in February, I found this quote particularly useful for me from a leadership point of view and for my team because we thought about what are we going to do? How are we going to respond? How are we going to act? So early days there, Jared. which of the three do you think it is? Because it's been, it's been peaks and troughs. Um, well, certainly, I've, I mean, it's, it's obviously a very terrible time. There's a lot of very, very bad things happening across the globe. Um, we don't for one minute want to miss that. Um, but at the same time, it is a chance to get stronger. You know, I started talking to my team early on about this gift and people thought I was a little bit weird, but it was a gift to say, what are we going to do? We've got a chance to step up and do some things differently. And uh, as a result of that, I think through March, April, May, we set about doing a whole range of things, which we can go into a bit later. But I think it is about a headspace to say, these things, they're sent to try us, they happen. Goodness knows we don't want them to happen. But now that they have, what we do next counts the most. So for us, it's all about making us stronger. And Georgia, what's the feedback you're getting from people? Are they working their way through this? Are they being positive and, and coming up with strategies to cope? I agree with Jared in that I think the ask the universe is asking something of us now, whether we're aware of it or not. And many people forced into change. And I and I see working with teams and, and leadership teams at the moment, the ones that are making the most of it are choosing the mindset shift, which is what Jared's talking about, which is what if this is happening for us, not to us? Mm. And it just throws you out of victim space and throws you into learning opportunities. And it's, it's those organisations, those individuals that actually can thrive that can do really well in these times but at the moment it's a head game once you get this right everything else comes along yeah absolutely and dom i mean you guys are always looking for different ways to to do things 
What's been the impact of that Atlassian you've seen? It, it's really, in, in so many regards, there was no impact because uh, like one of the examples three years ago, we acquired Trello. They had a, a rule set. If one person dialed into a call, everyone dialed in. So even if five of you are in the office, we always dialed in separately. So it saves you having to empathize. You just have a level playing field. And so we've been doing that forever anyway. So none of our meetings changed. I'm like, oh, it's just the same. I'm just working from home. And, and now you're imposing you know, in my lounge and on my life. I think from that regard, what we realized was the technology has been available for flexible working for a long time. Um, the mindset hasn't. And when I say mindset, let's call it what it is. It's trust, right? For many senior leaders, they've had this view that line of sight equals productivity equals people working, right? And so they hoarded people around desks, not because they thought it was optimal, because they didn't trust their people to not work anywhere else. And so I think that's the, the honest conversation we're having. And, and the danger here is, because this, is, to some extent, has happened to us, um, I've had the fortune or misfortune of dealing with the whole of the city leaders outside Atlassian who are like, here's the change we're driving now. And I'm like, I'm not sure you can pat yourself on the back for a pandemic. I'm not sure you can pat yourself on the back that, that you've delivered on these things because they did happen to you. It's a forcing function. And so I think we need a rebalance of reflection of saying, why didn't we do it earlier? Because the technology was there. What are the human to human practices that we need to put into place to actually make this work? And how do we make sure we take everyone along? Because whilst people say the great thing about COVID is we're all in the same boat, we're all in very different boats. I know some people that are struggling a huge amount and I consider myself very fortunate. I live by myself. This isn't even my apartment. I've just walked into a neighbor's place, but I, you know, I have the comfort <laughs> of dialing in from anywhere and doing my job. And I feel extremely privileged doing that, but I know so many people that aren't. And so I think, you know, I, I like to say never let a crisis go to waste, but in doing that, I think we need to, to double click and go, who are the people we might accidentally leave behind? And how do we make sure we don't? Because this, you know, equality right now isn't, isn't there in this environment for me. Yeah, well said, Dom. I think from, from my point of view, especially in terms of the importance of a, of a positive mindset, it's definitely been something that I've had to, I mean, personally practice my, my whole life. Um, it's, it's quite funny when you are born with a disability like I was, um, I guess on paper, I have a, a really tough life and a lot of people might feel sorry for me. It's always funny when my dad or my mum says, oh, I've got to go watch my son in the Paralympics. What do you think the first thing people say is? They say, oh, I'm sorry, what happened? Not, oh my God, he's going to the Paralympic Games. And mm. I think the importance of a positive perception, especially at a times like this, has never been more evident um, because people might you know, look at me and say, he can't get up steps, he might live a tough life. I mean, I live a better life than anybody that I've ever met. I'm easily the luckiest person to be doing what I'm doing. Um, and I guess there was a stage in my life where it could have gone either way. I could have felt sorry for myself and looked at my brother and said, hey, I can't kick a footy like him. Um, I won't be able to you know, go to the beach and run on the sand. But I guess it's really important for me in my life to look at all the things that I can do rather than things that I can't. And I think in the current pandemic, and I'm not trying to deny that it's so tough for all of us it really is and especially for people's mental health and things like that but there are definitely silver linings and positive aspects of this and as you said then dom the the increase in flexible working space has been so critical to helping people you know not only striving for the economy to grow but also maybe shining a light on some things that we didn't really think about i know as somebody with a disability we've been crying out for flexible working forever and so many people I know in my community have always said, look, I can get in the office for three days, but for one or two days, I need to work from home because of my extra care needs, because I can't mm. get in there, because I don't have a carer. And employees previously have been like, that means you might not get the job because we can't see you doing work. Um, how long has people had a bit of a sniffle and they've forced themselves to go to work when they haven't been productive as opposed to being trusted from working from home? and contributing to that organization. So, I mean, obviously there are so many negative things going on, but I think hopefully, you know, as it continues, because unfortunately it's probably not going away anytime soon, that shift in our mindset to finding out ways that this can benefit all of us and our organizations is, is so important. And even having conversations like this. Jared, can I ask, at one stage there, I think ANZ had about 95% of your workforce working remotely. Through what you've seen over the past few months, how has it been? So I think a couple of comments that the team have made already, it's been a very different experience for lots of people. 95% of our workforce from India to New Zealand. 
So you've got to think that through as well. It's not just different states in Australia. The experience in New Zealand has obviously been quite different to people in Manila, for example, or our team in Bengaluru, or even Chengdu, who were our, I guess, our front line, the first people to experience this back in January. So the difference, um, positives, negatives, we've learned a lot. I keep coming back to, I don't think that there are a lot of brand new trends through it, but I think it's accelerated a whole bunch of things that were coming at us anyway whether that's around sort of the flexible work agreements, um, sorts of thing that Dylan mentioned earlier, or even just the sheer focus within corporates around the importance of well-being, the importance of awareness, the roles that leaders play, all of that just is getting amplified. And we're, we're finding that in this short period of time, you know, if I just use a really simple example, um, the role of leaders to, to make meetings more engaging, think about how do we do that differently? Doing it remotely, you've got to go through a whole different process and mix it up a bit and have a little bit of fun. And it's not just about the team drinks on Friday, people are doing that. Um, but it's, you know, we, for example, Monday mornings, it's, it's, it's a mood day Monday. We check in and see how people are feeling, um, either what's happened well, what are they grateful for, or maybe what are they looking forward to this week? Little things that we're trying to ask our leaders to think about to make a difference. Georgia, how are the relationships happening now remotely? Because as Jared touched on, it's, We still need to connect, we still need to communicate, we still need to give feedback, we still need to work. It's same, but it's different. Mm, It is really different. And whilst there's so many opportunities in terms of remote workforces and, and, and flexibility, what we're really lacking now is we're lacking physical connection. And mm. that's actually part of how we're wired as humans. I miss hugs. Like I, I seriously <laughs> miss them. And, uh, and, and people actually just miss the energy of being with each other. And there's conversations about introverts and extro- extroverts, but that's not, we're actually wired to be with each other. And some of the things that are coming up in um, what conversations that I'm having and programs that I'm doing is that I'm seeing a lot of leaders actually question themselves and question whether, so Don's nodding, and questioning whether they can play this empathy role and can play the role of actually, I, I don't know that I know how to check in with people and I don't know how to show that I care. And I think that's a really cool conversation for people to be having with each other without or with themselves without shame like it's okay if you actually love doing the technical stuff more than you love doing the people stuff it's okay if you don't feel comfortable doing those components but what I feel like we need to give ourselves permission to do at the moment more is actually just hold space to be exactly where we're at and yes the you know the mood meetings and all those sort of things but we don't have to solve stuff and we're in such a workforce at the moment where you know, it's like I can hear my mum and dad, don't come to me with a problem, come to me with a solution. <laughs> and, you know, I'm calling BS on that because I, I, I just think we need to actually create time to be with each other. But what we really need to do is actually just know where each other is at. And I last week was in Struggle Town. Like I was really in Struggle Town. My dad passed away. 12 days ago and while he was sick he he actually just dropped dead really suddenly and it was you know it was really traumatic for all of us and I felt like then this was my first you know going back into doing client work and I was really shaky and I just thought actually Georgie you need to practice what you preach so I just started with this is where I'm at and I and I got upset and I was shaking and and I just thought I'm not going to do this pretense of pretending that everything's okay anymore because in Me- I'm in Melbourne. I can't even grieve with people. Like it's, it's stuffed up. Like it, it's, and, and what that then facilitated with is one, I had some breathing space because I could actually be real and human and not pretend that I'm not okay. And then it started this conversation where we threw people into, you know, chats to talk about where they were really at. And the feedback at the end of that was that was the best bit not learning around how I problem solve better or what I do. The best bit was where everybody went, yeah, I'm a little bit stuffed too or I'm a little bit struggling too. George, I couldn't agree anymore. And, and the, I mean, the, it's, the vulnerability in that is really relatable as well. And um, I've always been pretty stoic in the person that, that I am. And um, 
I've actually been struggling as well. There you go. And I think as soon as I started saying that out of my mouth, that, you know, my career was cancelled and uh, my life was turned upside down, just like everybody, God, I felt better. <laughs> and and being able to talk about it. And, and it's an important lesson from, as you said, from top tier leaders all the way down. You don't, just because you are a captain of a team, a CEO, a director, whatever it is, doesn't mean you can't be vulnerable. And I think when people are, especially the teams that work with you can relate a lot better to you. And they feel, I guess, create a safe space where they can talk about where they're at as well. And as you know, we're talking about today, this isn't just like a flash in the pan. This is the new normal for potentially a long time. So to develop those skills, I think is you know, so important. Dom, Atlassian has been, you know, had a lot, a lot of people working remotely for a long time. Uh, I was watching an interview you did and I was fascinated when you revealed your third biggest office. So you guys, in a way, have been prepared to a degree for what we're experiencing? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things uh, as, to, as to like wh why that's the case. First of all, um, I think there's a conversation about remote versus distributed. So one of the things that Gerard touched on, ANZ has locations all over the world. So the fact that you're in an ANZ office, you're still distributed. You have to find different ways of connecting, right? And travel isn't the answer to all of that. And so we've been finding ways of working as distributed teams around the world since we were born, right? We've always been spread around the world. What we then realized, kind of to Dylan's point, like you actually exclude a huge amount of the workforce, potential workforce, when you say nine to five, Monday to Friday, that desk. And the reality is we kind of sat there and we're like, there's no reason why that construct needs to exist. We're not running a production line. There is no correlation between your time at the desk and the genius you create. So why are we trying to force that? And suddenly over time, we start to experience it. We honestly thought a few years ago, we were really good. And then when we acquired Trello, we had that humble moment of going, oh, we're not actually really good. We're actually quite mediocre. And the great thing was that even though at last was big and Trello was small, we have this rule that whenever we acquire a company, we're like, what can we learn from you? We don't want you to become us. We want to learn from you. And so Trello was over 70% distributed and remote at the time. And so we learned a huge amount about their practices, their norms. But it's funny because whilst it gives you that access to the talent, you have to find human to human ways of working to build the inclusivity. Otherwise, you draw people in and then you push them straight out again. Right. It, it's similar to back when I started work, you know, early on in my career and everything felt like a boys club. You could talk about diversity, but for every woman that you hired, one left the door because it wasn't a great place to work. So we talk about diversity is the invite to the party, inclusion is the permission to dance. And so what we've been doing as we've been practicing that remote work is saying, hey, what works, what doesn't, what works, what doesn't, what works, what doesn't. And the hard thing for leaders is saying when you first try remote work or remote leadership, you're going to be crap at it. You're an amazing leader. You've got 25 years experience. But when you first try and build this new muscle, you'll be crap at it. Accept that and get comfortable with it. And that's the hard thing right now is as we're coming out of crisis, we've got a whole lot of people. We've mentioned vulnerability. We've mentioned empathy. They can say those words so easily, but damn, they are crap at it. <laughs> because it's not a natural skill for a lot of people. Vulnerability, very easy to say, very hard to do. For a lot of people, they talk about empathy. What I see is sympathy, right? Dylan's example. We're going to see our son at the Paralympics. Oh, 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 I feel for you. What happened? You're like, no, empathize with me. It's a celebration of his success, you bloody idiot, right? Mm -hmm. And we confuse those two pathies, right? Empathy and sympathy. And actually, as leaders, it's, it's not just about being vulnerable and, and managing a distributed workforce. It's about doing it authentically and real. And mm. so many leaders, unfortunately, walk around with invisible capes on and they think they need to be superheroes. And that is, that's going to kill any ability we have to build the future together because we'll be so hell-bent on being superheroes, we'll just copy, cut, and paste the past. And that, that's something we can't do. We have, to, we have to have that right level of introspection and reflection and realize that the future's not built. It's not determined. It's not written. We get to build it every day with our action or inaction. Mm -hmm. And inaction is as powerful as action sometimes. With that, just quickly picking up on that point, if I could, the irony is that, uh, she's my own experiences in the last little while, there are things that I've been doing in the last three months felt really, really uncomfortable. Um, they feel really different. And definitely crap at it. But it is about trying. It's the age-old thing of if I can actually build a muscle through practice, I'm going to practice on stage. I'm going to practice on the attic. I'm going to practice on court. There's no point practicing on my own. So practicing in front of other people, with your teams, other groups, some things work well. Also finding other people who are good at it and saying, well, hey, 
like the way you did that. Either can you come and help me or can I take a little bit of that and apply it? Because um, I certainly you know, hear what you're saying, Georgia, as far as we need to create space uh, to have the conversations. I think also try to provide an appropriate injection of ideas of things to try is also part of it. Not to fix it, but mm. to give some things to think about maybe is, is part of what we've got to try and do as leaders. Mm. I was just, it just reminds me, one of the organisations that I have loved um, watching grow is Vinamofo. And one of the things that I love about them is that the owners would celebrate the things that didn't work. They were just like, actually, we made this decision or we made this hire. It was wrong for these reasons. I made the wrong call. What I've learned from this is X. And it increases risk and gives people mission to fail. But in actual fact, failure is not the problem anymore. It's the learning from it that's actually the cool thing. And if you fail without learning, now you're the problem. So it's 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 recognising what you're talking about, Jared. is, you know, we're, let's just make mistakes together. I think if we don't keep learning from it, we actually, uh, we, we keep people holding back from either poor decisions or mistakes that they've made, which accelerates um, problems down the track. Can I tap into four really wise people here and speaking on behalf of other people that are like me, which now I'm talking to you, Tom, other people that are like me that really struggle in isolation. How do we combat that? What do we do? Well, I think one thing that, that really struck me and I know it really hurt the community that I'm from is even the term social distancing. So we mm. were told to, to be separated from each other in terms of 1.5 metres apart. But what that actually means in definition is socially people were removed from connecting with each other as well. Um, the term physical distancing is obviously a lot better because we don't want to be physically connected in terms of how close we are. But socially, we 100% have to stay connected. And I know during the first lockdown, um, especially for people, you know, there are people that are most vulnerable in our communities, people that are immunocompromised, things like that that have been in isolation since February and will continue to be in isolation for a very long period to come. And without that, as you said, that even that social connection, Brad, it makes it so tough for so many people. Um, and I think it's so important that more so than ever, you know, it's always important to do this, but more so than ever at the moment, to connect with people in whatever forms that you can. As simple as a text message, a phone call, a conversation like this, uh, it's so important to chat to people because even by us four doing this right now, I feel better. But yeah. in saying that, I think it's okay to be sometimes as well. And it's okay to feel down and it's okay to talk about that. You know, like I remember when it first came around, I was being a bit stoic and my beautiful partner Chantel's like, you're all right. And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. You know what I mean? But, you know, I actually had to talk about it. You know what I mean? And like, I had to be like, you know what? I'm supposed to be at Wimbledon today and it sucks that I'm not there. And I was, well, as soon as I said things like that, I felt better. There's probably a whole conversation there about, you know, the male use of the phrase, I'm fine, meaning the exact opposite. Because yeah. if, if, if there's one thing we should solve in the world right now, it's that. It's like, no, I'm fine. And you're like, okay, you're clearly not. And I find that, you know, and I've been a mental health advocate for a long time, but if I can sense something and maybe I can see a difference in somebody's behaviour, I'll say to them, how are you going? Really? How are you? Really? And even if they say fine, I follow up and go, really? Are you really? And every single time, they'll say, thanks. I really appreciate you asking. Hmm. But there's a, there's a thread there that you pulled on and Dylan pulled on, pulled on, which is like, know thyself, right? I, I think, you know, I, I've always been an advocate of thriving, right? Of, of living the best life. And actually, I've changed my bar in the last few months to surviving. I'm like, we're in crisis mode. Like th thriving's a nice to have right now. The reality is survival, right? Because the world has changed and all the foundations of that world have changed. And therefore in survival, I have to know myself and go, what are the things that are essential to my survival, right? Apparently, uh, personality surveys tell me that I'm an extrovert. So I get my energy from people, right? Go figure. And so I'm like, cool, how do I either substitute or replicate that in this new world? Because there's nothing to be gained by me whinging about it. So, so how can I go find substitutes or alternatives and then how can I embrace those even if I don't like them? So we did a, an exercise as an exec team the other week, and I thought it was going to be absolutely rubbish. It was Pinot and Picasso. So we got delivered wine. We got easels, canvases, and paints. And 20 execs with partners and children and aunties and uncles and all sorts dialed in, and we did a painting class together. 
And I thought it was going to be cringeworthy. And two and a half hours later, my stomach hurt from laughter because I can tell you with all certainty, there is no correlation between IQ and artistic ability. We were <laughs> awful at it. 100%. The, banter, the competitiveness, the, when we showed each other the pictures and people were like, oh, did you draw something different? But, and it, it, it was just a great reminder that for two hours, we could just be human together and just laugh. And it was okay. And that's nothing to do with productivity, kind of not anything to do specifically with wellness. It's just, let's hang together. And, let, yeah. and let's just do an activity. So I've, I've seen this come up a couple of times in conversations like this. Um, people who apparently, according to the tests, are in the extrovert category. Um, so I'll be the, the voice for the other half and sort of the little bit of wisdom for the group who actually like to disappear and go and sit on a mountain. Now is not the time to do that, particularly if you're leading a group, obviously. And that's hard, right? Because you can yeah. sort of actually feel quite comfortable. And we, we joke a little bit in my team, there's a few of us who sit there and say, hey, this is is awesome. No, actually, it's not awesome. And how do I make sure that I'm aware of my own energy levels and the energy of the rest of the people in the virtual room? I think to, to Dom's point, that's a question I used to ask, uh, I guess, pre-COVID, and I still try and find myself asking today as I start each day, you know, where's my levels at? And what are the sessions I've got coming up? What's the energy of the other people in the room? So that we do check in and ask how you're going and take it. I mean, genuine interest. Yes, we care. Mm -hmm. um, some people manifest that differently. Jared, I know in the article that I referenced earlier, you pointed out that well-being. this is not something now to be driven by HR, people and culture. This is to be driven by all leaders, everyone. It, it is, and I think that, that whole idea of this was something that was coming at us anyway. If you go back to last year, the year before, mindfulness, awareness, um, all of those movements be getting I guess, more support and, and genuine support, not just sort of lip service. And then this happens and immediately it just goes on steroids. So I think to me, that's the, that's the point here is to say from a leadership point of view, what is it that we do to build these skills in ourselves, regardless of the tech, forget the tech. I was on a session the other day, which was supposed to be all about tech and ended up all being about culture and people because mm -hmm. that's what it is, is how are we going? Yes, we can use these tools as little hacks to help us but how are we going to help support our teams through what is clearly going to be an extended period that has challenge and somewhere in there there is opportunity to george's mm. point the universe is throwing whatever it's throwing at us and you know mm. it'd be a shame to miss that opportunity in amongst all of the other challenges we've got and as leaders awareness mindfulness creating a space meditation if you use an app if you read a book if you, whatever it is everyone's going to find their way but I think it just comes down to some very basic principles, which have, they're not new in human history, but mm. we've probably lost our way a little bit over the last little while. And this has been a bit of a reset. Mm. I, have, I have a firm view that like 50, 60 years ago in business, when a leader, if a leader said they were going to go for a run, everyone would be like, what are you running from? And then gyms became normal. And, and, and I have the hope that mental health becomes the same kind of first class citizen. I think we're in a weird time though, where we've put accelerant on it through COVID it doesn't necessarily mean we've got any better at it. And so I think we need sort of, uh, like, like George has said, space, you know, Gerald used to talk about forgiveness. Like, how do we create this moment where we're like, it's okay that you're not great at this yet. And, and, and the examples I've seen, I was on a call with a, an organization the other week, the senior leader did an amazing talk about where people first, we care about you and your families and do this and take time out and we're gonna give you extra holidays, all this stuff. And I was like, it was heartwarming. And then the last moment snatched defeat from the jaws of the victory by saying, but don't forget to hit all your key four goals. And I was like, no, <laughs> you were doing so well for seven minutes and then, and then you ruined it. And so we're still finding this balance of, of how do we follow through on that? And, and that wasn't like, that, that, thankfully that leader wasn't punished. It was a great teachable moment to go, how can we deliver that message and, and keep the, the people message center and, and not distract with, you, you're allowed some time out as, as long as you've done everything else first. We shouldn't yeah. underestimate the accelerant piece. I read a little quote the other day, and these things stick in my head anyway. Um, yeah, when someone's drowning, it's a bad time to give them a swimming lesson. Yeah. So right now, we're just going to be also mindful of everything else that's going on and finding yeah. sensible ways to inject, but not uh, overwhelming. Yes. Dom, you touched on people there before. Um, I love your response when people say that your Atlassian is in the tech business. Yeah, we're a people business. Like, I like all of our IP our innovation, our creativity, our curiosity, it's, it's all people. We happen to choose technology as the vehicle 
to deploy that both internally and then and then what we share with our customers. But actually, and, and, and Gerard's a great example of this, where our customers have come back and told us stories. They don't say, oh, I used this feature and did this thing. They're like, here's how it helped evolve our culture or how our people work or it helps us achieve an outcome. Um, we just happen to have chosen technology as a vehicle. So the, the people centricity for us has always been front and center and, and I think helps us not only build a great culture and values over time, but scale those things effectively. Because we've had epic growth, both geographically and, and in terms of numbers in that time. So it's, it's very easy to lose that spirit if you're not careful. Can I ask everyone a phrase that um, I think we're probably all a little tired of, but it's part of the world that we're in. Don't say pivot. No, I'm not going to say pivot. It's almost on the banned list, but um, new normal, okay? New normal. I know, I know, but it is. It's something that we didn't consider previously. But my question to all of you is, what is the new normal? Really, I mean, you're a futurist, Dom. What is it? I don't know. So, so it, it's, it's funny because every day is a new normal, right? Like I've been a futurist for years and the thing I laugh about is people ask me for predictions and I'm like, no, 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 I, I'm not going to predict what I'm going to ask you to do is to take an action and measure yourself on the outcome and the impact that you have, right? That's you, you get to create your own future every single day when you wake up, right? And so the reality is, is that if you look at change over the last five, 10, 15, however long period of time you look at, businesses have been building a new normal every single day. The, the, the most relevant businesses today you look at Netflix as an example, there's very little resemblance to the original version of itself, right? They've evolved every single day. And so we've been doing this. What's happened right now is, is we've taken a hold of traditional businesses and said, oh, lots of things about your business model doesn't work. And they're like, oh, we need to build a new normal or the next normal. Or the, and it's like, well, actually, maybe you don't because I'm going to promise you, you're not going to be able to predict it. So how about you just evolve a little bit every day and that evolution will, will enable you to stay relevant. So I think the superpowers of great businesses right now is the ability to adapt, the ability to have high learning velocity, which Georgia talked, on, talked about before. How do you take an insight and turn it into action? And the ability to be nimble, right? If you can do those three things, you stay relevant. And, and actually the idea, you know, a senior leader said to me, we need to build an 18 month plan for our new normal. And I'm like, I don't think you get it because three months ago, COVID didn't exist. So an 18 month plan is already a waste of time. Like you, there's no way of getting that right. So how do you break it down to more manageable chunks and actually reward and recognize progress over perfection? Yeah, well said, Dom. I tell you the one thing that I am finding abnormal that is affecting the new normal for me is not being able to hug my mum. I know we've talked about it on, on, on this call, but that lack of connection with the people that you love, especially in a physical sense, I think that's why things like words and actions are going to be so important to create that connection that we don't normally have and and i think that's going to be a tough thing for, for people to to deal with for a long period of time and and it's okay to accept that and and try and find other ways around it to do that but i think it's so important that people unfortunately stick to the rules and, and keep doing that otherwise you know this will drag on longer than it should but also um if we don't it'll affect people that are vulnerable in our community in the worst possible mm. way so so well said, Dylan. I actually think the pursuit of trying to find what's normal is something that's crippling us because, one, it's something you can't define because there's no such thing. I never want to be normal, ever. So let that go on the record. But also, if, if we're pursuing, if, one, we've got to define it, and then when we get, if we don't get there, it creates disappointment, and we're never going to get there anyway because there's going to be a whole different amount of perspectives around what that looks like and and so all the energy created into trying to create a vision of a future or something that you think looks relatively okay to accept is actually the wrong amount of energy i think surrendering to what we're in right now and how we make the best of it business wise personal wise is actually a much better process mm. and, um, and and journey to establish. And that's where we do get the Kaizen effects, you know, which is what you're talking about, Dom, which is, okay, what work, what could be better? So what's one more thing that we can do to have a better day tomorrow, either personally or professionally or as an organisation? That's a much better distribution of energy than trying to define something that's actually nearly impossible. Absolutely. Jared, moving forward um i imagine like so many organizations anz has maybe uh, pondered over doing things differently for a long time all of a sudden you do them differently because you have to you get thrown into the deep end 
Some things work, which Dom touched on. You give it a go. If it doesn't work, you move on. Other things don't work, but it's about just trying different things because we're in an environment where we just have to adapt, don't we? Yeah, I mean, we all talk about this idea of failing fast. Um, we don't necessarily practice it. So again, I think it comes back to this thing of being really honest with yourselves. Um, we are trying some things that are going to work. Some things may work brilliantly for one group but not for another group as well. So it's not just about the thing. It's about the context of that particular team, where they are at, their skills, their, their current position. So I think it's just, again, we could come back to this thing of awareness and really being connected to your team, knowing where they're at, talking to them, and then trying things together and celebrating the things that work well and talking pretty publicly about the things that don't go so well and, and what do I learn from it? Back to George's point, if I learn something, then that's great. I picked up, you know, always make new mistakes. It's another little adage to try and throw out there. Everyone, thank you very much. We are going to pause for a moment because shortly we're about to wrap things up. Or are we? Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. It's been terrific. Jared. I know that you've got to go, and I just want to put this out there to the others, is I think we have unfinished business. There's so much more to discuss, and we're enjoying having a good old banter, chinwag, storytelling session. To the others, would you be okay if we kept going? And let's turn, let's turn this chapter into two chapters. What do you think? I mean, sounds right. good. Well, I'm really jealous that I can't stay. It's been a fantastic conversation. And uh, I think to one of the comments earlier, I got a ton out of it just by sitting and listening. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what part two is, even if I can't be in it. And uh, really, really, really do appreciate the conversation with the team. So well done, guys. And uh, we'll speak soon. Stay well, everyone. Take care. Thanks very much, Jared. Really appreciate your input. Dylan, Georgia and Dom, we'll be back in a moment with part B, thank you for watching. This is The Wellbeing Conversation. Hey everyone, Dylan Allcott again. Now we touched on a few topics around mental health throughout that chat. Now if that brought up anything for you, make sure you reach out to beyondblue.org.au or their phone number is 1300 224636. You can also hit up Lifeline on 13 11 14 or reach out to the people within your ANZ teams and they'll be able to help. And here's a little taste on what's coming up on the next episode of The Wellbeing Conversation. I've seen a lot of people struggle with their identity. Am I the only person that has no purpose? Am I the only person that is feeling this? Am I the only person that isn't sure about what's going to happen next? And I think right now with the changes we're going through, if we can't find a way of unlearning the old habits and rituals, we'll never have the time to learn the new ones. The only room that he can get peace at the moment is actually in the bathroom. Yeah. And he was a bit embarrassed. I'm like, no, this is, we just got to be real. Because as soon as I did that, and I stopped sucking about not being able to go to the Paralympics, I immediately felt better. We don't own people as assets. They're not resources. We borrow them from their family for eight hours a day, and our job is to return them in a better state than we took them in.